In this video lecture, we're going to look at uh, the application of John Rawls's uh, political philosophy in the sphere of business ethics. And we're specifically going to look at Mark A. Cohen's uh, article, The Narrow Application of Rawls in Business Ethics. So <clears throat> let's just briefly, uh, you know, recount the principles of justice as articulated by John Rawls. So Rawls advocates a contractualist uh, 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 position, meaning you know uh, uh, certain principles of justice that are established whereby people um, uh, unanimously agree to them. Now he says that this can be achieved by first establishing an original position. So the original position is where uh, all all persons uh, you know relevant in this community or society are going to to. Uh, uh, to be gathered to consider various principles of justice and which ones they're going to agree to that will uh, 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 be established as fundamental for uh, that society or community. Now, only those, though, who are open-minded, right? So we can't have um, biased people being considered uh, uh, principles of justice, um, which ones they'll choose. We can't have, so this would, you know, we can't have like, uh, let's say racists or something like that, right? Uh, Open-minded persons who will uh, pursue rationally, right, the best principles of justice uh, that they think are are in their interest, their own rational interest. Now, before though they just you know look at various principles of justice, they have to be placed behind a veil of ignorance. This ensures that they will not uh, uh, take into consideration uh, their race, their class their gender, uh, their, their, you know, educational um, background or anything else like that. So this way, you know, whatever principles of justice they might agree to, uh, they wouldn't be doing so because they know, like, let's say they're white and under principles of like a uh, white supremacist system, they would benefit, right? So this would, you know, make them consider, well, what if I ended up being black or what if I was handicapped, right? Would I, uh, agree to then living in circumstances according to some principles of justice that might not, you know, f benefit uh, a handicapped uh, uh, person. And so what the idea is uh, persons in the original position will use uh, basic kind of, you know, choice uh, uh, reasoning to, to determine, okay, well, it makes more sense that, you know, I don't know whether I'm going to be rich or poor, but you know, let's say like the one system makes it so that like it's possible if I am poor to at least not be like miserable or have a chance to become wealthier. As for another system, you know, it's really great if I'm rich, but it's going to be miserable if I'm poor. Well, it obviously makes more sense than to choose uh, uh, the system where um, you have greater chance of like class mobility, say, than the one where if you're rich, great, but if you're not, then life sucks because you have a greater chance then of, of, of uh, living a good life in the, the former as opposed to the latter uh, system. So Rawls thinks that then in the original position, all those persons would agree to uh, one set of principles. Uh, he, he calls this, you know, justice as fairness. And there are two principles behind it, the two principles of justice then. The first is the liberty principle. The liberty principle says that everyone has... A, a, a basic scheme of rights that are coextensive with everyone else having access to those same amounts of rights. So that means no one can have, let's say, like, uh, you know, five uh, votes in an election while others get one. Everyone gets one vote. Everyone has equal access to, um, you know, run for, for office or, or something like that, right? Everyone is equal under the law. Things like that, right? So kind of almost formal political uh, principles. Now, the other principle of justice, though, is known as the difference principle. The difference principle is more of an economic and social principle, and it basically says uh, inequality is permitted so long as it either does not worsen uh, uh, those that are worst off or in so doing it, it, it benefits to some extent the worse off. So the idea is you can have, for example, the existence of private property so long as it does not worsen uh, um, the, the existence of the, those who are worse off or as long as it, it ben then ends up benefiting those who are worse off, right? So you can have people who are really rich as long as, you know, it doesn't hurt 
uh, poor people or at least it might help poor people. And the same thing, right? You can have like wealth redistribution so long as uh, it doesn't violate the liberty principle and so long as it doesn't hurt the worst off. Uh, and, and of course, it would you know, benefit uh, the worst off. So the idea then is that th those two principles of justice are meant to regulate what Rawls calls the basic structure. That is the kind of background institutions that make up society, such as the legal system, uh, uh, social practices, economic institutions, all those things that comprise uh, a, society's, uh, a society's system of social cooperation. So in a sense, the kind of principles of justice that Rawls uh, um, comes up with are those which serve as the foundation for a society, but they don't, um, let's say, play like a, um, uh, a, a determining role um, you know, like in every, it's not like they, they direct what people can do every uh, instant is where like you might think of something like utilitarianism where every moment you're thinking, okay, what does utilitarianism say is the right thing to do? You know, what Rawls establishes isn't that, it, it's something that is meant to establish, okay, what are the parameters within which like businesses can exist? What are the parameters within like, you know, a just legal system can exist? And you establish those legal systems that then are free to come up with their own rules as long as they don't violate, of course, the principles of justice. Now, how does this apply then to business and business ethics specifically? So we can see then that this is a kind of contractualist model of stakeholder rights. That there is, because the principles of justice uh, interest all those who are subject then to uh, the domain of, of, of the state, right? And therefore, uh, everyone is, you know, hypothetically entering uh, the original position, then in a sense, they're all stakeholders within, uh, you know, what is going to potentially benefit them from the different uh, economic institutions or the social um, systems and so on. In the same way, then, um, the Rawlsian system of justice does advo advocate for a kind of um, stakeholder rights model for business ethics. But as we'll see, it's going to be a very different kind of stakeholder rights model than like that promoted by uh, deontology or utilitarianism or, uh, you know, established like um, uh, institutional business ethics. So first, what we can see is that the two principles of justice secure stakeholder theory as a normative theory on the rights and obligations of citizens. That it says then what uh, uh, sh citizens should have access to and what then they have to do uh, based on certain responsibilities they have bestowed on them by those rights. So Rawls says, or sorry, Cohen says, uh, the principles of justice articulate at an abstract level the rights of citizens. And these rights give citizens legitimate social interests in the space of economic activity. And this shows that stakeholders as citizens have legitimate interests in economic activities or transactions whether or not they're uh, directly party. The reason is because we know in the original position, which then concerns all citizens, they would want to know, okay, would the principles of justice we might agree to, would they permit, uh, let's say, polluting of a river by a business? Well, it may not be my river that ends up being polluted, but I have an interest in whether or not, right, I agree to that, that model because it has to be unanimous decision whether or not we would agree to that. And we know that, you know, with uh, 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 the two principles of justice, um, persons would not agree to uh, principles of justice that say, yes, businesses have a right to pollute rivers as much as they want. No one would agree to that because they don't know if, you know, it's likely they could be living next to that river that might, you know, negatively impact them. Even if it ends up when they live in that society, they're not, you know, actually directly impacted by that. Now, additionally, this kind of stakeholder theory that we get through Rawls's uh, contractualism is a theory of rights to be protected at the institutional level, which means it's not determined by managers or corporations. So it is government and society at large that determines the kind of rights that are protected and, and that determines the parameters of, of how businesses may, may operate. It is not up to managers or corporations themselves to determine. So the principles of justice secure the interests of citizens in the space of economic activity generally. It says, yes, persons in the original position would agree that um, it is in everyone's interest to be able to you know, buy and sell as they please within reason. 
But additionally, it says that the principles of justice do not secure the interests of economic agents in particular transactions. So, no, uh, uh, you know, the principles of justice would not allow um, uh, it, it, it to be determined that, like, Austin, for example, can never buy books, but everyone else can buy books, right? Um, it, it, it has broad uh, uh, stakes, not, not particular stakes that are, that are at interest here. Now, some potential issues then do arise in terms of the implementation of the two principles of justice in business ethics. Now, one of these is the question of whether the principles of justice, for example, secure maternity rights in the economic sphere of life. Is it the case then that um, the principles of justice would say, yes, uh, uh, women have a right to, let's say, like maternity leave, for example? Now, Cohen says, maternity benefits and support for women who leave the workplace to raise children present complex questions in business ethics, because it might seem like this then would be a particular case that would be favoring particular individuals. And we're, of course, looking at just a framework for how society and businesses would operate. So continuing, Cohen says, a number of options exist, and they could be defended in a variety of ways. But for all the question would be whether we need maternity benefits and particular legal support for women in order to protect their fair access to social and economic opportunity, right? So whether or not this protects them according to the first principle of justice, the liberty principle, uh, as well as, <clears throat> excuse me, with the economic opportunity, what the second principle of justice requires. So the question is, if we had it, uh, the case that maternity rights... <clears throat> Excuse me. If we had it being the case that maternity rights um, did not exist for women, would they be uh, put in a position that is worse off for them overall? The, qu the answer to that would be yes, of course, because it, it means... Uh, Business is just less likely to hire a, a woman because of that, because then they think, well, you know, uh, one, we're going to lose a worker for an extended period of time. And then two, the business is going to have to still keep paying the worker so they can, of course, stay home and take care of, of, of children. What that means then is, yes, a whole sphere, half of all citizens would be denied then economic and social opportunity. They wouldn't have fair access to it. So we can see in this case that uh, in terms of you know maternity rights in the economic sphere of life, the two principles of justice would uh, say that um, women do have a right to maternity benefits, for example. Now, other potential uh, issues that arise that we would have to apply the two principles of justice to have to do with workplace democracy. Does everyone have a right to workplace democracy? Minimum wage requirements, environmental regulations, immigration policies, or even potentially union protections, right? These are additional issues that would have to be worked out uh, according to the two principles of justice. Now, if there were further economic uh, uh, rights implemented, they would end up violating citizens' freedom. So for Rawls, the liberty principle is always uh, the primary principle for which then the, the difference principle uh, comes second. So according to the principles of justice, then, citizens should be free to pursue their own interests as economic agents as long as they do not violate the principles of justice. So that means all citizens should have an equal opportunity then to, to let's say, like, you know, open a business or sell goods or buy products, right? Or, um, you know, uh, 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 better themselves by getting a better job. But... Whether or not they can have a right to, let's say, you know, a job that makes $100,000 a year, that would end up violating the principles of justice. So those additional uh, potential economic rights, like a right to a job that pays $100,000 uh, a year, that would end up violating uh, the liberty principle because it could then demand that certain people have to work a certain amount of time or something like that uh, to ensure that that um, uh, occurs. So additional rights or obligations like that attached to economic activity ends up amounting to an unreasonable limitation on individual freedom. So Cohen gives this example of where he says, I, make, I might claim a right to a flexible work schedule, 
if protected at the institutional level or somehow enforced, this supposed right would restrict a firm's manager from arranging work schedules in a way that best meets organizational goals. And this restriction is unjustified because the right in question, the right to a flexible work schedule, is not derived from the principles of justice. So for two reasons. One, the right to a flexible work schedule would violate then uh, the right that all citizens have to be free to pursue their own interests as economic uh, uh, agents in the economic sphere. And additionally, the fact that uh, this would also put uh, 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 burdens on others then uh, based on uh, the liberty principle then. Now, what this also means, though, is businesses actually can be as ruthless as they want in terms of, you know, just being in business for the sake of profit. The principles of justice would allow businesses to do nothing else but pursue profit as long as they are within the bounds of the principles of justice. So, of course, again, they cannot enslave people in the pursuit of profit. They cannot uh, uh, pollute rivers as much as they want. Those would violate the principles of justice. But what a government can do, though, is, you know, potentially regulate a business, uh, or sorry, what they cannot do is potentially, you know, like regulate a business uh, to spend a certain amount of time or money on environmental causes. So government cannot determine, according to the principles of justice, that all businesses should donate like 10% of their profits to charity. What a government can do, though, is use its own power to, uh, you know, pers um, to address uh, causes of injustice or causes of poverty or other things like that. But it cannot mandate that businesses have to do this. So you should be noticing then, according to Rawls, the principles of the two principles of justice put the onus on society at large and the government to ensure that uh, uh, businesses and persons behave morally or at least set up the framework where they can do that. And it doesn't put the onus on businesses to have to uh, uh, act moral. But what that also means, though, is what businesses do in general is the concern of citizens, that citizens do have an interest in whether or not, you know, uh, uh, a business, um, again, pollutes a river, whether or not a business um, is, is you know, uh, um, uh, causing a community to, uh, you know, degrade or other things like that um, through, like, bad business practices or something like that. Now, some people might want to say, no, but there are like certain conceptions of the good that we, we might want businesses to promote. And we might want to say, look, a business has a moral responsibility to pursue the good. The question, though, is, well, what is the good? So Rawls argues that in modern liberal democracies, citizens hold a variety of comprehensive moral doctrines with different conceptions of the good. Some citizens hold conceptions of the good that are religious in nature. Others might be, you know, uh, uh, holding that the good is, is deontological or that the good is, is happiness in the way of utilitarianism or the good has to do with virtue like Aristotle's virtue ethics. Which one is correct? Well, the fact is there are just a plurality of views held in liberal democracies. What do we do with this? Should a government or a business then legislate one conception of the good over others? How do we know? How does a business or a government know which one is correct? Right? So there's an epistemological problem. Some of these have to do with the fact that, you know, theories of the good, um, determining which one is correct, uh, involves complex evidence that's difficult to assess and evaluate. You know, it's not necessarily quantitative. These are qualitative issues. We have disagreements then, uh, you know, among persons that are interested in these questions about the weight of evidence. You know, think about, for example, with uh, utilitarianism and wanting to weigh, you know, to what extent um, one act uh, is, is more valuable than another. Now, in some cases, we can weigh them, but only if the criteria is similar. In some cases, like we might want to ask, OK, is it the case that uh, teaching philosophy brings happiness more than like teaching uh, English or something like that, right? Well, what is the criteria then that, that we're going to evaluate uh, these two different claims on? In some cases, it seems arbitrary. So there's a certain kind of indeterminacy then in the application of our concepts, including even what, you know, the good actually is. It's, it's a bit indeterminate, um, uh, uh, you know, about what that actually is. So because 
that uh, uh, because we have these epistemological problems of actually one knowing right uh, what the good actually is, and two, we know the fact that there's a plurality of views held am among citizens about what the good is, then the principles of justice then can only provide mutually accepted point of view for resolving competing claims about rights and obligations. Because since we know various people hold different views about the good, then they would never in the original position agree to one conception of the good because they don't know in that society if they would end up agreeing to one conception of the good uh, uh, over another when they might actually end up uh, believing in a different kind that might be punished in that society if they were going to agree to uh, principles of justice that promoted one conception of the good over another. So basically, you know, business ethics cannot promote one conception of the good other than that which can be, uh, uh, you know, mutually agreed to in the original position. What that means then is all uh, the contractualist framework can tell us is that uh, we have to set it up such that people can pursue their own conceptions of the good as long as they don't interfere with the ability of others to pursue their own conception of the good. Now, I've already briefly mentioned this, but what this means then is that there's a different conception of business ethics here that, that we uh, can derive from the application of Rawls' uh, philosophy in the realm of business ethics. Now, because we can't settle questions of fairness about the market in a theoretical way, there must be a market of sorts in which persons will choose to affiliate with or to work for certain organizations or not. Right? And we know that this ends up uh, uh, potentially being dangerous because it means some persons can be left to victims of uh, economic force and coercion. That it might be the case that just because they grew up in um, a, play, a, a poorer area, they end up having to work more hours. They are disadvantaged socially or economically. And we're not quite sure what to do. Now, there are two options here. One, we address this issue of you know, potential victimhood in the marketplace. Uh, or coercion in the marketplace through addressing these, these issues of fairness within the economic system itself, which means we put pressure on businesses to solve these problems. Now, Cohen thinks that this is not the answer because competitive pressures in the economic system are always intensifying. And that means we can't expect corporations to act responsi uh, responsibly because they're always going to be held to, uh, to their bottom line, which is profit. It doesn't matter if a business is doing something which is moral if they're not making a profit. If they're not making a profit, they're not going to remain in business. And that means we can't then ultimately rely on businesses to do the right thing. Instead, it is only then activity in the political realm that we have to uh, pursue. That it's only within using government that we can make society more just. So the practical side of business ethics then isn't actually business itself, it is society at large and the government. That it must be then the political process. Because business ethics must appeal to the principles of justice or to the fundamental features of the democratic process. That these issues are decided democratically and it's not up to individual businesses what they want to pursue. I mean, and I should say this, you know, in a certain way, this kind of uh, 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 counteracts the dominant kind of um, model of business ethics, which is the managerial stakeholder model, where business ethics is meant to uh, help managers become more ethical. And this is not to say that Rawls is saying that, you know, managers or workers in business shouldn't worry about being ethical. But what Rawls, you know, uh, when we, what Cohen is saying when we apply Rawls' philosophy to, to business ethics is that the only thing that it's moral to do is to set up a foundation that all would agree to. After that foundation, though, we have to leave people up to their, uh, to their own ability to pursue their own conception of the good. And that means the ultimate onus in a business ethics has to be on society at a foundational level, which involves the political process, and not necessarily relying on hoping that you know, the CEO uh, is going to be a good person and not you know, a bad person. So basically what Cohen then uh, advocates is what he calls the moral market approach. So again, that, that, 
you know, stakeholder uh, managerial model, he calls the moral manager model, right? It says business ethics is organized around taking business organizations as the fundamental unit of analysis, introducing ethics into corporate decision making. Instead, using contractualism, he advocates what he calls the moral markets model, where business ethics is a responsibility of all to improve the business system by creating more efficient markets with more efficient regulation. So specifically, he says, specifically, the principles would place these decisions in the hands of citizens to decide how market transactions should be constrained. The goal, then, is not exactly moral markets, but a fair society which requires that boundaries be placed around the market. In other words, the morality of the market is measured and realized in the broader social system of which the market is a part. Now, there are some potential criticisms to this approach. One of these is that moral considerations can't be restricted to the market without extension into managerial decision making. That, well, sometimes managers do have to make tough decisions. And we would think that, well, there sometimes might be a place then for a manager to know, hey, like, is there some kind of like conceptual, you know, moral tools I can appeal to to try and figure out what's the right thing to do? Additionally, if business is an amoral space, why would we want to regulate it anyways, based on especially moral reasons? Why would we want to regulate business, which is going to be amoral because it's solely just a realm of, of you know, uh, uh, market transactions? Why would we want to regulate it for moral reasons? This seems contradictory. Additionally, there are gaps in the legal and regulatory framework that will always seem to exist, where sometimes we might want to set up laws, but of course, you know, uh, problems end up inevitably arising anyways, right? And only morally responsible management will identify those gaps in real time in order to preempt wrongdoing. So it seems like there might still be some place for um, uh, managerial responsibility in business ethics, even if we wanted to accept the contractualist approach that, hey, the onus though, uh, uh, or, or, you know, the fundamental concern is on uh, uh, government and political institutions. And I think some of that, you know, some of that reasoning comes from, you know, we can look at Aristotle and what he talks about with the fact that, you know, the best system is a system where it relies on laws, but even laws, because they are general in nature, uh, sometimes can account for particularities. And that's why you would want a wise ruler that can then determine what do we do with those, these particular problems of which then, you know, they kind of slip through the confines of what the law would say uh, we should do. So these are all some potential criticisms that maybe, um, you know, maybe it, it means that we can't accept the, the Rawlsian approach to business ethics. Maybe we have to um, uh, slightly reformulate the Rawlsian approach to business ethics. Maybe these potential criticisms actually, you know, aren't problems at all. And, you know, because maybe the Rawls uh, uh, in applying the two principles of justice to business ethics, um, could deal with these problems, right? So maybe they are actually problems that can be settled within um, uh, within the Rawlsian framework. Uh, we'll have to think about that.